welcome dear participants to the ninth week of our course. In this module, we would start discussing how culture and media are interdependent and how the culture and also the technology shapes a particular media for the people. Today we would discuss the beginnings of the cinema and the relationship between the word and the image which has propelled people throughout the globe and throughout the ages to the manifestation of their ideas through drawings, through theater and through other means as and when they were available with the help of technology. Relationship between the word and the image is central to our understanding of the relationship not only between film and literature but also literature and media, culture and media and also the people and the media. The relationship between the word and the image has always preoccupied the attention of the people. In the very beginnings of various civilizations that proceed automatically, various arguments and debates about the encounters between film and literature and similar type of debates, we find that there were practices which had combined verbal sign and the visual image to communicate the ideas precisely and in a better manner. People must have always felt even in the early dawns of civilization that the use of words is not enough for the expression of their ideas, emotions and sensitivity and therefore they have always taken recourse to some type of a visual image. Researchers tell us that the prehistoric cave drawings were also the attempt of the people to express their ideas in a visual format. Researchers also point out that the origins also link the Egyptian hieroglyphics, the Chinese ideograms to various other visual images which were developed later on. All these practices have combined verbal signs and visual images and these practices can be recognized as the attempts of human beings to record events and narrate stories about themselves. These attempts have anticipated the combination of literary means and technological moving images used in films. We can say that whatever sources and whatever capabilities were available to the people, people have always tried to express them not only with words but also combining the word with the image. And therefore, these early attempts very well anticipate the later date, a much later inno innovation of technology in the form of moving images and the literary expressions. Development in both western as well as non-western societies have featured a rich source of visual and verbal written signs. For example, in all cultures we come across manuscripts which are illustrated and illuminated. The 16th century Europe had a rich tradition of religious iconography. The construction designs of the Renaissance theatre which can be understood as a visual forum for the elaborate dialogue for the presentation of the theatre, the play as well as having a particular type of dialogue with the audience. Storytelling through camera obscura and other precursors to camera can also be incorporated in this tradition. Relationship between seeing and saying is thus central to all debates about production of knowledge, identity, culture and also politics. So, today in our discussions we will briefly look at some basic traditions of seeing and saying by looking at the historical development of various genres including theatre, the technological developments which also incorporate camera obscura and the development of photography which are central to the projection of film media later on. The origin of the theatres can be traced back to the 6th century BC and the origins of theatre have been located with the ancient Greece practices of dithyrams, which were choral hymn songs and dance by the followers of Dionysus. Aristotle has described that dithyrams were the precursors of Greek tragedy. In Athens, there used to be competitions during the festivals of Dionysus, Linania, 
uh, celebrations of the life of Dionysus or revelries surrounding food, wine and fertility etc. So, it incorporated poetry, choral hymns etc, merry making and then some type of a spectacle with the medium of theater uh, was also enacted. In the 6th century BC, we find that a priest of Dionysus whose name is referred to as Thespis has introduced an element which later on was considered to be central to the development of the theatre and he had engaged a dialogue with the chorus. Prior to that we find that dithyrams were based on chorus singing only. For the first time we find that Thespis has introduced this element of having a dialogue with the chorus. So, we find that dialogue as well as chorus became an integral part of these type of performances. It is later on developed into a full fledged study of Greek tragedy which is dated around 5th century BC. Though very few tragedies have survived as full text, but still we find that many of us are familiar with the works of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Europides. They have retained the choral character of dithyrams and the, the tragedies dealt with the dramatization of Greek mythologies. Aeschylus is credited with the introduction of a second character in his tragedies and that is why we find that there has been a tradition of development in terms of as technology was understood at that time. So, whereas in dithyrams we had only the chorus and later on the dialogue was introduced with the chorus, we find that Aeschylus has also introduced the second character in and around 5th century BC. We find that Sophocles has also introduced a subtle characterization and a complex plot structure in his tragedies and at the same time Europides is credited with the depiction of examination of human frailties. So, we find that overall in the Greek civilization there has been a development in terms of the techniques of theatre. In the 5th century BC along with the Greek tragedy, comedy was also flourishing which began basically as a part of the Dionysian festival Linnaea. During this festival a particular comedy was normally performed and now we find that only the work of one comedian Aristophanes has survived so far. Unlike the tragedies, the comedies dealt with contemporary life. So, we can say that the subject matter of the theatre had also changed from the dithyrams the, which had a choral appreciation of the deities and from the tragedies which were based on significant events and characters, we find that comedies had incorporated a discussion of the contemporary life. These were also often ribald and often used to satirize uh, contemporary events and the chorus was also an important element in these comedies. Roman theatre which was influenced by the Greek theatre had borrowed conventions and plots from Greek dramas. Their comedies were normally set in Athens and they were performed as part of the Roman games also. The work of the two com famous comedians which is still available is uh, related with Plotus who is known for his farce and Terence who is known for his comedy of manners. However, after the fall of the Roman Empire, we find that the theatre as an art had declined and in the period of upheaval which followed the decline of the Roman Empire, we find that theatre as an art was not retained by the people. Another significant development in terms of theatre can be related with the liturgical drama. The origin of the liturgical drama is in the church and the church attempted to enliven Easter festivities and drama was used a way, a means to attract people in order to disseminate and popularize the biblical stories particularly about the life of Christ. These stories which were enacted during the liturgical drama performance were centered around the theme of the resurrection of Christ. We can further put them into different categories as mystery plays, miracle plays or morality plays, but in all these dramatic performances we find that church had been the, at the center. The idea was to popularize the Christian doctrines and ideals and these plays often per were performed as part of liturgical services just outside the premises of the church. 
A particular aspect of the liturgical drama which is noticeable at this point is that they had used the language of the masses. The mystery and miracle plays as we have seen already were based on stories drawn from biblical mythology and had a medieval imagination. They were often contrasting the two binaries good versus evil, angel versus demons, hell versus heaven etc. And miracle plays had concerned, um, were concerned about the lives and the struggles of saints. Gradually in these mystery and miracle plays, a particular element of processional entertainment was incorporated which helped the church to popularize the drama. The mystery plays became unfashionable in the 16th century in the Protestant Europe because it was considered that the ribaldry and the revelry which was a necessary part of these plays was at odds with the Protestant values. But they remain important in the Catholic strongholds which recognize the power of drama as a means to popularize Christian doctrines. Around this time during the 16th and 18th century, we find that in other parts of the Europe also theatre was flourishing and a particular reference should be made to Commedia dell'arte which had originated in Italy. It was a form of popular street theatre. A particular contribution of this particular performance art was that they had introduced actresses. Prior to that often the characters of women were played by men, but they had introduced actresses for the first time in medieval Europe. They were performed by a troupe of professional actors and actresses who travelled from place to place using slapstick comedy farce. They also used masks and props and often were based on the improvisation of a story and material to suit the audience with the help of some stock and stereotypical characters. All of us are aware of the significance of the English Renaissance theatre. Whereas in previous decades, plays were performed in courtyards of inns and audience would stand often in the courtyards or in open galleries around the yard, we find that the patronage system was gradually abolished. And in the English Renaissance theatre, we find that it became a commercial form of entertainment and at the same time, it democratized the art of theatre performance. In 1576, James Burbage built a, the first permanent playhouse which was called the theatre outside the city of London. And very soon we find that these permanent buildings flourished. For example, in 1577 it was the curtain, in 1587 it was the rose, 1594 the swan and the globe was built in 1599 where many of the plays by Shakespeare were first performed. In this Renaissance theatre we find that the audience used to be very large and it also represented a mixed crowd. It was a motley group of people from different walks of life. The audience also used to pay to watch the performances and the design of the Renaissance theatre in itself is considered to be an architectural novelty so that people could stand and sit and watch the performances and feel a type of a participative atmosphere. Because of these changes, because it became a commercial form of art and entertainment and it also became a democratized affair, we find that English drama emerged as a major form of popular entertainment and Christopher Marlowe, Shakespearean plays, at the same time the plays by Ben Jonson, Thomas Dicker, Thomas Middleton and Webster were also popular. It was followed by the restoration drama. After a ban of 18 years in England under the Puritan regime, we find that in 1660 the theatres had reopened and the restoration comedies were known for sexually explicit content, ribaldry and wit. They used intricate costumes, intricate sceneries, fireworks, tricks and props, use of baroque elements so that they could be popularized once again. They had also introduced a female performance 
uh, in England, even though in Italy and other parts of Europe it was already practiced. We find that in the Renaissance theatre, female characters were enacted by young boys and it was only in the restoration drama that in Britain female performers were introduced. Restoration drama is often criticized for being immorally suspect and having a decadent nature of characters and plots because they centered around love triangles and court intrigues and courtships also. However, it became widely popular among the aristocrats, the middle classes and also among the ordinary working, cla working classes. We also have on record a female playwright who was also popular during the restoration time and whose name is Ephra Ben. It was followed by the neoclassical drama. It was a dominant form of theatre in the 18th century, which maintained an emphasis on decorum. And it also realized that the classical Greek and Roman forms of theatre are the perfect examples. So, following these examples, the neoclassical drama also put an emphasis on classical unities, the three unities of time, place and action. It also had an intricate dialogue, elaborate costumes and sceneries, which it had inherited from the restoration drama. It basically worked around political satires and Dryden and Pope are the famous playwrights of the neoclassical drama. In the 19th century, we find that various theatrical traditions were thriving across Europe. In the early part of the 19th century, we find that in France, melodrama had become very popular. Whereas in Germany, we find that the tradition of romanticism was flourishing. The historical accuracy in their costumes and settings, their emphasis on nationalist fervor, the Istram and Drum movement, these issues popularized morality and spirituality, which could be seen in the plays of Lessing, Getty and Schiller. In Britain, we find that around this time, Shelley and Byron were the major dramatists. In the later period of the 19th century, we find that the drama flourished in two different directions, realism and non-realism, gradually leading to symbolism and also we can say, uh, some type of expressionism and they can be considered as precursors of these two movements which became popular in the 20th century. We find that around late 18th and early 19th century, there was a social and cultural anxiety across Europe. There was a proliferation of writing, spectacles, entertainments which attracted masses. To, it, to a very large extent, we find that development in the technology, the early stages of technology is also responsible for the involvement of the people in these changes. The development in the printing in, industry, the iron press was introduced in 1798, followed very soon by the steam press, made the print available to the common masses and therefore the tendency to read, to be educated could flourish among the middle class people. So, books and prints around this time proliferated through mass production and dissemination of words and image became easier and also attained a permanent footing. Because once it was printed on a paper, people could refer to it repeatedly instead of memorizing it or looking at it only once. So, these inventions prepared an expanding middle class of readers, a middle class which did not have inherited money, but saw these opportunities as a way to escape the poverty of their circumstances. So, we find that these changes in the social and cultural milieu as well as these changes in the technology gave an impetus to the desire of the people to transcend the limitations of their class through the medium of education. And so, we find that an expanding middle class was prepared, which consisted of readers, spectators and therefore, could also be treated as consumers of the culture. In the later 19th century, we find that there was a fascination with visuals which promoted scientific and cultural development of new mechanisms for reproducing images. So, technology had popularized the print medium, 
But at the same time, we find that technology was developing in another parallel field, which popularized the desire for having new mechanisms for reproducing images, giving birth to different types of camera technology. At the same time, we find that in the socio-cultural milieu, number of aesthetic movements were taking place in arts, theatre and philosophy. For example, naturalism, surrealism, symbolism, expressionism, etc. So, the academic atmosphere and the intellectual curiosity of the late 18th and early 19th century was such a steep phenomena that it gave way to different changes, not only in socio-political milieu, but also in terms of technological development. We can say that the socio-cultural anxiety of these times made it possible for the scientists to pursue their imagination in a particular way. The socio-cultural anxiety of these times which we have referred to can be seen in the growing debates concerning the juxtaposition of these two mediums, the printed word and the printed image. It is interesting to note that in the early 19th century, William Wordsworth, the famous romantic poet, has railed against the growing culture of image and has suggested that the cultured people would automatically be drawn towards the printed words and would therefore discard the image. However, we find that a contemporary of Wordsworth, William Blake, has envisioned reproduction of images as a complex counterpoint to the poetry that faced those images. So, as early as the 19th century, these discussions had started and these cultural and aesthetic debates can be considered as a prelude to the future questions which surrounded like high versus low culture, active reading versus passive fascination, individual sense versus mass sensibility creative expression versus mechanical reproduction, words versus images as a pedagogical tool. So, we find that these debates in their quintessential form were active as early as the beginning of the 19th century and technological developments have given a significant di dimension and direction to these debates. The first significant development of technology in the area of production of images can be termed as camera obscura. The Latin name translates to dark chamber and it is considered to be the ancestor of contemporary photographic camera. The term camera obscura was first used by Kepler in the 17th century and it refers to the natural optical phenomena creation of an inverted image formed by light rays passing through a pinhole into a darkened room. The development of the camera obscura took two different tracks. One of these led to the portable box device that was a drawing tool and in the 17th and 18th century many artists were aided by the use of the camera obscura. So, here this is a pictorial representation of camera obscura which suggests about its functioning. This is also a wooden box camera obscura, an image from a camera of 1817. By the beginning of the 19th century, the camera obscura was ready with little or no modification to accept a sheet of light sensitive material to become the photographic camera. The other track which it took for the development became the camera obscura room a combination of education and entertainment. So, we find that this basic rudimentary technology or behind the development of camera obscura simultaneously took two different paths for individual development, individual artist as well as a tool for education and entertainment. So, in the 19th century with improved lenses that could cast larger and sharper images, the camera obscura flourished at the seaside and in areas of scenic beauties. If we look at the timeline of the invention of photography, we find that there has been a quick development in the art of photography gradually. 
The antecedents as we have already seen can be found in camera obscura as well as the pinhole camera. In 1770, Joan Schulz made transitory sun prints of words by using stencil, sunlight and a bottled mixture of chalk and silver nitrate. Thomas Wedgwood had conceived of making permanent pictures using a double surface coated with a light sensitive chemical. In 1816, Niepig succeeded in making negative photographs of camera images on paper coated with silver chloride. In either 1826 or in 1827, he also made what is now the earliest survive, surviving photograph from nature that was a landscape. It required an exposure in the camera that lasts at least 8 hours. In 1835, Henry Fox Talbot produced durable silver chloride camera negatives on paper and invented the procedure used in most non-electronic photography up to the present. In 1839, we find that Louis Deguere introduced his daguerreotype process which produced highly detailed permanent photographs on silver plated sheets of copper. So, we find that photography suddenly enters the public domain. It comes out of the labs and it enters the people's life, it enters the market and it also enters literary productions. At the same time, we find that technology changes and then the developments are continually being introduced. In 1848, Edmund Bickerell makes the first full color photographs, but it had remained only as a laboratory curiosity. It did not come out in the public field. In 1888, the Kodak box camera was the first easy to use camera uh, to be introduced in the market. And in the same year, we find that Louis Le Prince makes round a garden scene, the first ever motion picture on film. In 1889, the first commercially available transparent cellulite roll film is also introduced by Kodak. In 1891, William Kennedy Laurie Dixon develops the kinetoscopic motion picture camera while working for Thomas Edison. And in 1895, Auguste and Louis Lumiere invent the cinematography. In 1893, Kinetograph was patented by Thomas Edison. It was the first movie camera and first movie which was given the title A uh, Sneeze became the precursor of crude documentaries of street life, trains, etc. In 1894, Kinetoscope was introduced. It was a bulky coin operated peep show viewer for one. And we find that with, with the advent of Kinetoscope, Kinetoscope parlors also opened and people came to view 30 to 60 second films there. In 1896, a particular uh, film was introduced with the title The Kiss, which was a first close up of Kiss on film and it was considered as highly scandalous at that time. This is a photograph of kinetograph, a motion picture camera which was developed by William Kennedy Laurie Dixon and Thomas Elva Edison uh, during 1888. This is the kinetoscope invented by Edison and William Dixon in 1891. It is from the Batman archive. So, here is a small video which was recorded on January 7, 1894 with the title A Sneeze. It is a very short video, but it gives us a fairly good idea of the sensation it might have created among the people who were used to only looking at a printed photograph in black and white and that too not, never in abundance. So, let us play it. The developments of the camera techniques were also being continually adapted by literary people. Literary sensibility also incorporated the new realism of photography. We have already seen how the debates in the early 19th century had started and now we find that novelists like Flaubert and George Eliot were using close-ups and precise panoramas of local scenes in their novels. Hawthorne's The House of Seven Gables published in 1850 had a central character with the name of Hallgrave 
who was a daguerreotypist or an early photographer who turns the plot climactically. Browning's poetry also incorporated snapshots of Renaissance artists and art. So, we find that continually new blends and composite works are appearing. Combining literature and the new technology of moving images. There were magic lantern projects on the works of Walter Scott and other historical narratives. Narrative storytelling supported by lithographic images particularly after 1880 when the half tone photo engravings were started they became popular in the periodicals. The photo essay a particularly new genre was started and we can quote Jacob Rees how the other half lives which combine news and commentary with photo illustrations. In the 20th century also we find that some photo essays are popular from Eugene Smith to Cindy Sherman and at the same time in the documentary novels the new journalism of Norman Mailer in 1960s similar type of trends can also be seen. As the 19th century ends and the 20th century begins we find that the two art forms are independently established. During the 19th century people were trying to accommodate the two, but as we would see in our next discussion the two art forms towards the end of the 19th century were independently established enriching each other, but also interdependent and independent of each other. Thank you.